Hello and welcome friends, uh, I am Dr. Achim Mehra. I am here today to discuss a case of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, a common motor neuron disorder and one of the most devastating neurodegenerative disorder that we know. But I always feel to understand a topic which is tough and difficult, why not solve an MCQ related to it? So that while reading the topic, we come to know what is to be read and what is to be left. So here's the question from our own question bank, the Dams question bank DQB. A middle-aged man presents with dysphagia, dysarthria as a complaint. If you know difficulty in solving, difficulty in articulation or speech, reflects the problem in the lower cranial nerves that is originating from the brainstem, especially the 10th and the 12th from the medulla. So there is a lesion in the brainstem, the lower brainstem medulla in this case. There is progressive atrophy and weakness of the right hand and the forearm also in the patient. Now atrophy as a sign if you look at is a sign of an element paralysis. So the right upper limb of the patient suffers with an element paralysis. On the other spectrum, the left lower limb of the patient shows spasticity with hyperreflexia. In the knee and the ankle jerk seems to be exaggerated on the left lower limb. So the left lower limb of the patient happens to be in a phase of UMN paralysis. So what do we have with us? We have a patient who has come to me with a lesion in medulla, which I can call as a bulbar palsy, with the right upper limb of the patient showing an element paralysis and the left lower limb of the patient showing a UMN paralysis. All this put together is a combined thing, or rather we call this as a Mahagadbandha nowadays, of a disorder which originates in the motor neurons in the patient, known as a motor neuron disease. If you have any idea about this, one of the most common MND that we have is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Now the question read here is this, the most likely clinical diagnosis in the case is a definite ALS, possible ALS, probable ALS or an absolute ALS. Oh my God. I knew that it is ALS, but is it definite, possible, probable? Ye bhi theek hai, wo bhi theek hai, si bhi theek hai. So let's see what is TK in this question. Now, if you know amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is also named in United States of America as the Louis Gehrig disease because uh, Louis Gehrig, who was a famous uh, baseball player who played for the New York Yankees, suffered with this and unfortunately he died very young because of this neurodegenerative disorder. And he also got a title in his life as the Iron Horse. But in France, uh, a famous neurologist there, Jean Martin Chakov, uh, coined the term ALS. And of course, if you remember the year 2014, to increase the awareness of the disease, the, the Western world started with the ice bucket challenge, in which you nominate some of your family members or friend to take it, so that everyone knows how to have a bath with the ice, of course, one thing. And of course, they are more aware of the disease ALS. And India, we know this, we took it as an opportunity to have a bath at least, especially in winters. If you're not from North India, I hope you understand what I'm talking about. Now, in patients of ALS, what, where is the lesion like? If I can project this whole as a part of the central nervous system in which the corticospinal tract originates from the brain. So there can be lesion in the corticospinal tract in the cortex itself or in the descending pathway anywhere. So whenever you have a lesion in the corticospinal tract, remember this, the patient suffers with an upper motor neuron kind of paralysis. The lesion in motor neuron disorder could be in the brainstem homologue of the corticospinal tract also. And that tract is known as a corticobulbar tract, resulting in a pseudobulbar palsy. While the lesion can be in pons, can be in medulla, involving the cranial nuclei over there, and this is all known as a bulbar palsy. In patients of ALS, the lesion can be in the anterior horn in the spinal cord also, resulting in an element palsy. So look at this, a patient who comes to me with a UMN palsy in one segment, element palsy in another segment, or maybe with some bulbar and a pseudo bulbar palsy also, all combined together as a Mahagandbandha known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Now, if you know ALS is, as I said, it's a most common progressive motor neuron disease, is one of the most devastating neurodegenerative disorder for the reason that from the onset, the person succumbs to it within a span of three to five years time. 
The incidence, although not very common, is 1 to 3 per 1 lakh, but of course there are risk factors for it. Exposure to pesticides, smoking and military service. Now if you are watching Hindi movies, I believe smoking and military service, I think so, Dev Sa will always come into your mind with this song, Zinki ka gum dhuye mein urata chala gaya. Sorry, I'm not promoting smoking at this platform because I believe smoking is always injurious for your health. Same like Delhi nowadays is injurious to our health. And in Delhi now we are renaming places uh, or the signboards depending on the disorders which come from the smog. In patients of ALS, remember this, the problem can happen in one generation which can be called as sporadic. Or the disorder can happen in generation to generation as familial following the autosomal dominant trait. More common are sporadic types, 10% are just familial. The familial people can be due to a mutation on chromosome number 9 involving this C9ORF72 gene. Most common familial mutation is this itself. Then superoxide dismutase, one mutation that is from the chromosome 21 that account to 20% of the cases. TDP43 mutation again that account to just 5% and FUS mutation that again accounts for just 5% of the cases. Now what is autosomal dominant trait if you know? It's generation to generation it goes from the grandfather to the father and to the son. Okay. Now familial ALS if I look at it can be due to the C9ORF72 mutation and what is this ORF standing for? It stands for the open reading frame on chromosome number 9. Here what happens is that there is a hexanucleotide comprising of 6 nucleotides together and more than 30 repeats happen. This results in the misfolding of the protein of course and finally aggregation of the protein in the brain cells causing a neurodegenerative disorder affecting the corticospinal, corticobulbar or maybe the cranial nuclei or maybe the cell in the spinal cord. Now remember this same kind of mutation, the open reading frame mutation is responsible for another disorder which is neurodegenerative involving the cortex, the frontotemporal dementia. Remember this, this ALS patient could also suffer with FTD because of the common gene mutation causing both the disorders. Now another mutation that we saw on chromosome 21 was a superoxide dismutase SOD1 mutation. Now what is the function of this enzyme? If you know there is a free radical superoxide with us which is generated in the cell after of a lot of stresses inside it, the superoxide dismutase 1 is going to convert it into a non-toxic metabolite. Now if this enzyme is missing what do we find? A lot of superoxide moieties. Finally there is going to be neurodegeneration due to free radical damage that is known as apoptosis. So there are two kinds of things which we can understand in the pathogenesis of familial ALS. Now clinical features of ALS, remember this, the first evidence of the disease is always an in serious onset, asymmetrical weakness which is more distal than proximal reflecting the corticospinal tract involvement and of course if the hands are involved, the extensors are more involved than the flexors in them. And one of the signs of any element palsy that is wasting of the muscle known as atrophy. So in a patient with an atrophic limb compared to the contralateral limb, there is a lot of muscle wasting seen in them. And of course don't forget whenever the lesion is at the level of the interior cell, we find visible and a palpable muscle twitch known as fasciculation. So if you can see in this video, there is a fasciculation that is a visible and a palpable muscle twitch seen in the thigh muscles of the patient. Now if all this thing happens overnight, a lot of fasciculation. Next day, of course, when the person gets up from the bed, there is going to be a lot of cramping pain on awakening. Yes, so whenever the person wakes up from the bed, he is so restless because of this cramping pain that he suffers in the morning. Now the brainstem lesion as I was talking about could be in two types. The lesion is in medulla, it could be a bulbar palsy or the lesion is above medulla involving the corticobulbar tract is known as a pseudobulbar palsy. What are the key differences between the two? Bulbar palsy, the 10th canal nerve is not working. We are unable to swallow the food properly. There is going to be difficulty in swallowing, that is dysphagia. Remember this, bulbar, the lesion is medulla, medullary lesions are nuclear lesions. 
nuclear lesions neurologically are LMN and in LMN we always find a flaccid kind of a weakness. So this dysphagia is flaccid dysphagia. So whenever the person tries to swallow something, the food bolus or the water, anything gets stuck in the neck region or the throat region because of the poor swallowing. While in pseudobulbar what happens, the same dysphagia happens, but you know, pseudobulbar the lesion is corticobulbar, which is supranuclear. Supranuclear lesions are UMN and in UMN we find what? Spasticity. So dysphagic complaint in a pseudobulbar palsy is often spastic. So whenever the person swallows the water, there is a lot of contraction in the pharyngeal muscle and everything will come out from the nose. There can be a lot of nasal regurgitation like this which happens in them. Another quick difference between bulbar and pseudobulbar is regarding difficulty in articulation of speech known as dysarthria. Now if the 12th kidney nerve is the nucleus is not working, the 12th kidney nerve will not get any signal, the tongue will not move properly. So whatever word in my brain I have formed, it will not come on on the tongue properly. That is known as slurring of speech, also known as dysarthria. Let me repeat it again. Bulbar, the lesion is nuclear. Nuclear lesions are element. Element, we find what? Flaccidity. So this patient is going to have a flaccid dysarthria. On the other spectrum, pseudobulbar, the lesion is corticobulbar, which is supranuclear. Supranuclear lesions are UMN. And in UMN, we find spasticity. But how will they actually differ? Like a person who suffers with a flaccid dysarthria has got slurring of speech because of difficulty in moving the tongue properly and the words don't articulate that well. So how would this person speak? Like this. Don't have an outgoing this. This is our life saving test. Let us be in our nest. A humble request as COVID is catching everywhere. So, possibly I've tried to mimic it as I could, but sorry if, if I was wrong in this. But there is a lot of difficulty in articulating words properly. But the message should be very clear to the public on this. Okay. Uh, Pseudobulbar palsy, it's a spastic dysarthria. You now the tongue goes stiff and spastic. How would it sound like? I think so. The best example will be uh, the ex American prisoner who who doesn't declare him to be ex anymore, uh, who came to India, Donald Trump, and in his speech, how did he talk like this? Swami Vive Kamunand Suchin Tendulkar. Yeah, there were a lot of spasticity in his speech, yes, and his thoughts also later on. Okay. Now, bulbar and pseudobulbar could also be differed on one more thing. Gag reflex. I stimulate the posterior pharyngeal wall of the patient with a spatula. And the person might cough and there may be some movement of the pharynx, obviously see. In bulbar, the lesion is nuclear involving the telkidna nerve nucleus causing a reflex here because remember bulbar the lesion is nuclear nuclear lesions are element so we find in patients of bulbar palsy the gag reflex is absent that's why they had a lot of difficulty in swallowing food or water even right in pseudobulbar the lesion is corticobulbar corticobulbar is umn supranuclear and in umn you find what spasticity so this time the gag reflex will be very big so the moment you just stimulate the posterior pharyngeal wall Things are going to be very worse, a person might just choke, right? Now, another quick thing is a difference between pseudobulbar and bulbar is this. A, gag, a jaw jug. In jaw jug, we tap the knee hammer onto the mandible. Yes, and in a normal jaw jug also, we don't find any upward movement of the jaw. In bulbar palsy, if the fifth cranial nerve nucleus is involved in pons, the person won't have this jaw jug at all. So in this case, what would happen is when we tap the knee hammer, the signal goes into the pons via the fifth canine nerve sensory input on the face and the signal comes out from the pons to the jaw muscles. Yes, the masseter causing the clenching of the jaw, the upward movement of the jaw in the jaw jaw. Look at this, the bulbar palsy as the book explains is not only a lesion in medulla, it could also be a lesion in pons. So we have a lesion in pons this time in bulbar palsy. The fifth canine nerve nucleus is not working, so I expect the jaw jug to be absent here. 
So whatever afferent comes in, the efferent doesn't go out. And look at this, the nuclear lesions are LMN, in LMN reflexes are absent. Simple. Pseudobulbar. Yes. The lesion is suprapontine. Supranuclear lesions, which are UMN. And then UMN reflexes are brisk. So this time the jaw jerk might be brisk in the patient. When we tap the knee hammer onto the mandible, the person might just close the teeth tightly. There is a lot of clenching of the teeth seen. So jaw jerk, remember this, in you and me also, if you go and test, could be absent. Yeah, absent jaw jerk could be a normal finding also. But abnormal pathognomic is always a breast jaw jerk. So next time in the ward, whenever you find a patient with a breast jaw jerk, think about a supranuclear or a pseudobulbar palsy in that case. Another quick difference in bulbar, as I explained, they kind of have difficulty in chewing, swallowing, yes. Fasciculation, remember this, you know, fasciculation happens whenever the lesion is at the level of anterior That could be seen in the patient's limb, but it could also happen when the lesion is in the nucleus. Remember this, whatever the anterior in the spinal cord is doing, the same thing, the brain, the brainstem especially, the cranial nerve nucleus also do the same work. So fasciculation could be seen in the tongue muscle this time in patients of bulbar palsy. Pseudobulbar palsy have got one other interesting event, exaggerated motor expression or the emotions, which is also known as the pseudobulbar effect. That means whenever the person is feeling very sad, you just keep on crying a lot. Or if the person is feeling very happy, he is going to laugh out loud on this. So a joker would be the perfect example of a pseudobulbar effect which is also known as a labile effect the mood keeps on changing very very frequently in death let me summarize everything uh, what's the key differences between a bulbar and a pseudobulbar palsy that we find in pseudobulbar the lesion is supranuclear above pons and medulla involving the corticobulbar tract especially while the bulbar palsy is a lesion in medulla or the pons involving the nucleus of the kidney nerves so dysphagia as you saw in bulbar palsy was flaccid, in pseudobulbar was spastic, dysarthria is flaccid in bulbar, it is spastic in pseudobulbar, fasciculation are present in bulbar, absent in pseudobulbar, labile effect was something very important for a pseudobulbar palsy, gag reflex was absent in bulbar, brisk in pseudobulbar and jaw jerk is absent in bulbar and of course brisk in pseudobulbar. So these are the key differences between bulbar and the pseudobulbar palsy that we know. Now uh, normal inhale is very important in spite of everything so wrong in them few things are still normal. Like eye muscles aren't they normal in them? The sensory system is perfectly normal in them. The bladder is okay in them and cognition is well maintained. So if you remember this famous portrait of Mona Lisa she was very famous for a smile and maybe her eyes also. You look to her left, you look to her right, she will always look at you. In this COVID time, yes, she will again look at you. So a person of ALS will always keep looking at you because of the intact eye muscles. The bladder is normal and of course they are very intelligent people. The cognition is well maintained in them. Now differential diagnosis is very important. Like if a patient comes to me with an LMN and UMN palsy, I think of other things apart from ALS like cervical cord compression. Remember this, cervical cord compression at the level of lesion will result in an element paralysis. Below the level of the lesion would always result in a UMN paralysis. But it's a spinal cord injury, it's myelopathy. So we are going to find sensory symptoms and bladder dysfunction in them. Yes. And chronic lead poisoning would be another, another differential for this plumbism. But occupational exposure is important in the history of such patients. And of course, thyrotoxicosis, these patients, you know, other systemic symptoms of hyperthyroidism would be more evident in them, apart from motor weakness only, okay. Now, the World Federation of Neurology has put in diagnostic guidelines for a patient of ALS. They say that the person should have a UMN element involvement with a progressive weakness, one thing. An exclusion of all alternative diagnosis should be there in them. You think about everything else and negate it out. But remember the sites which are involved in patients of ALS could be bulbar, cervical, thoracic or lumbosacral. So out of these four sites, you need to look into the patient clinically 
and see what is human and what is element. If three or more than three sites are involved, it's a definite ALS. If two sites are involved, it's a probable ALS. If just one site is involved, it is possible ALS. Or conditions apply. Sometimes you can have only one site involved, but the person shows an SO D1 gene mutation. Then you can think about as a case of definite ALS. So what do we have here? We have a possible ALS, we have a probable ALS, and we could also have a definite ALS anytime. Treatment important, Rylozol is a drug which is used in ALS patient. How does Rylozol work? You know, glutamate as a neurotransmitter excitatory would be released from a neuron. It is going to act on the adjacent neuron and cause the influx of calcium into the adjacent neuron. But unfortunately, this adjacent neuron is undergoing neurodegeneration, like in patients of ALS. So this calcium is going to increase the whole process of apoptosis in them. Rylozol now comes into the picture. It inhibits the release of glutamate from the adjacent neuron, inhibits the calcium influx and inhibits apoptosis. Remember, Rylozol is an oral drug. The dose is almost 100 mg per day for it, but it's not a magic bullet. It just improves the survival by some three months time. Okay. And of course, the adverse effect you should be aware of is deranged LFT, weight loss and nausea in them. Another drug that is used in treatment is Zidaravon. It's an injectable drug. It happens to have an antioxidant effect. A free radical scavenger, maybe it works like a superoxide dismutase enzyme for me. But again, it's not a magic bullet. It just causes modest reduction in worsening in the cases. Okay, so still there is, there is no cure of this disease. There's some control only by some kind of supportive therapy. For example, if the person is suffering with dysphagia due to bulbar palsy, you go in for a feeding gastrostomy in them to maintain the normal nutrition. If at all, you know this, you know, they are more likely to aspirate, okay? So what we'll do, we'll improve the lung compliance also. Some people of ALS that we have seen are most commonly dying due to respiratory failure. That can happen anytime. So we tell them at the night time especially to go in for a positive pressure ventilation, which is through a CPAP or a BiPAP mode. Cuff assist device again to prevent any kind of aspiration in them. And speech synthesizers. Now this is something new. To improve the dysarthria, you know, we have got some speech synthesizers which we fit into the patient and the speech is now proper in them. So there is no cure, there is just control by all these methods. Now coming back to our question. A middle-aged man presents a dysphagia dysarthria. Okay, so this is our middle-aged man, Amadmi. He came to us with dysphagia and dysarthria as a complaint which I think is a bulbar palsy. There is a trophy in weakness of the right hand and the forearm, which is an element paralysis and the right upper limb is having a cervical innervation. Spasticity of the left leg with the exaggerated reflexes. It is a human fancy that is a lumbosacral type. Okay. Now in this case, bulbar, cervical and lumbosacral, three sites are involved. So it is what? A definite ALS. Now let's look into the question again, dysphagia, dysarthria and all this, what is your answer? Definite ALS. Now many students uh, ask me, sir, what is this absolute ALS? No, this is just a neologism that I had while making this MCQ. So, a hi theek hai, not ye bhi theek hai, wo bhi theek hai, a hi theek hai. So definite ALS is the correct answer. Now if you remember the famous uh, scientist in America passed away with this devastating illness, uh, Stephen Hawking. And he lived a very good life, you know, uh, doing a lot of discoveries, everything, writing papers. And he suffered with this uh, ALS disorder. But I remember his, one of his thoughts that however difficult life may seem, there is always something that you can do and succeed at. It matters that you don't just give up at this moment. So let's remember Stephen Hawking at this moment who suffered with ALS. And what did he say at the end is to succeed, you don't have to give up. Try, try till you succeed. Like after watching the IPL, you know, uh, the Delhi I said to the Delhi Capitals any time that we always expected more from you. And you know, Mumbai Indians, when anyone touches the IPL Cup anytime, the Rohit Sharma or any of the Mumbai Indian player, uh, 
gets paranoid about it and they always ask to keep it back okay the kabir singh in them comes out because bazi rao ki talwar aur rohit sharma ke balle pe koi sandeh nahi hai and you know rcb fans are very sad when will you take the revenge rcb as usual we have not taken any decision on it let's see in the next season so is varsh cup namde that was the slogan of rcb but in mumbai indian is varsh cup maza hai became to the came to the mumbai indians but is varsh uh, pg seat namde so i believe if you don't give up at this moment uh, the pg seat will fall into your lap okay in this tournament of all the examinations all the best all the best